We must have a high view of God's word. It's got the power to deliver the depressed and the oppressed. It's got the power to restore relationships. The power to save souls and save the city. It's got the power to defeat the devil. Make one wise. Renew one's mind. Shape one's worldview. And direct one's life. Listen to me. The word of God is all sufficient. Again, it's the ultimate weapon. Let us bow our heads. God, we rejoice in your word. We rejoice in your word because it's your word. Through your word, Lord, we get to know who you are and how you think, what you delight in, <clears throat> what you don't like. And Father, I just pray that you would speak through me in a very clear way today as we go over the person of the Antichrist and that, that we would be awakened and alarmed to the times that we're living in. That we would not be sleepy Christians. We would not have bedheads, but that we would have bruised knees instead. Yes. Praying to you, calling out to you, trusting in you. And so have your way with me, Lord, and minister to your people as you always do so faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Antichrist is coming. As you can see, the man on the screen doesn't have a face. At least we can't see it because we won't know who the Antichrist is exactly until the seven-year Great Tribulation. Last Sunday, we looked at the main sign of the end times. Does anybody remember what that main sign was? Just one word, it starts with a D. Close. Deception. Deception. Hey, they're connected. It was deception. John is telling us that in the last days, which is the last hour, we're living in the last moments, it's going to be mainly made up of many people denying one aspect of Jesus Christ. Some will say he's man, but he's not God. Some will say he's God, but he's not fully man. Some will say... He's really not God's son. And so they have all these different versions of who Jesus is. And John is saying in the last days, that's going to be the case. And we see that in false religions today and in individual hearts. Many people do not know the biblical Christ. And he says that would be a sign of the last hour. In fact, these people, these individuals, whether they're false preachers and teachers or just everyday people that deny Jesus Christ in any which way, these are the people that John says are antichrists. Not the antichrist, but antichrists. They're against Christ. They have something else in their hearts instead of him. And these people are literally led by the spirit of the antichrist. Now in this world, people are either led by the spirit of God or the spirit of antichrist. Those are the only two spirits that lead people. The spirit of the world, which is the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Satan, or you have the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and his word and truth. There is no middle ground. But today we'll focus on the Antichrist. If the Apostle John warned the church of his day about the coming Antichrist, then so will I. Amen. I told you guys last week that there are many preachers nowadays that are trying to discredit end times teachings they're trying to stay away from teachings about the antichrist and the end of time because supposedly it's in this unpopular or it brings some type of fear mongering but in reality the word of god as we go through the word of god and god wants to uh talk about certain things we're not going to skip those things we're in john chapter 2 and verse 18 and that's what we're going to talk about amen you're going to get the full word of god in this place amen yes. why because god is watching and god is worthy amen. that's it oh and by the way because you're loved okay amen. let us open our bibles to first john chapter 2 and verse 18 first john 2:18 The passage says, little children, it is the last hour. And as I told you last week, that's a long hour. 
2,000 years. This last hour has lasted from the first coming to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But as you know, that was the last hour. If that was the last hour, we're living in the very last seconds of time. Can I get an amen? He says, and as, if you have, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. And that's where I got the title for today's message. The Antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. In other words, that's going to be the sure sign, the sign that we're living in the last days. Deception. Deception. Any type of lie, anything that's contrary to the word of God, anything that is said that is contrary to the person of Jesus Christ, that there is antichrist. Now, in the first century, John warned that the Antichrist, or we can also say the instead of Christ, right, is coming. And I wrote here, if we're in the last moments of time, then it's very possible that for us in this 21st century, the Antichrist is most likely already here. But in reality, as I said before, we just don't know who he is. And we won't know who he is until the seven-year great tribulation. For more detail on who the Antichrist is and what he will do here in the very near future, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to be reading from verses 1 to 10. And as I always say, if you haven't been reading your Bible this week, um, you're going to do some catching up, okay? So... <laughs> The subtitle may read, The Beast from the East. I'm just kidding, from the sea. Verse 1. Then I stood, this is John speaking, John the Revelator, John the Apostle, the same John that wrote 1 John, writes Revelation. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and seven and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. This is in regards to the Antichrist. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to war with him? Five, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. In other words, he's got a big dirty mouth that needs a bar of soap shoved in there. Seven, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe tongue and nation basically just means he has authority over the entire world all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if anyone has an ear let him hear he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword here is the patience and the faith of the saints. We see here that the beast that rises up from the sea, maybe even the bottomless pit, is the Antichrist. And it's referring to a specific sinister man, an actual human being. But this Antichrist, as we see here, is indwelt by Satan himself. In Revelation 12, 9 tells us that Satan and his demons were cast out of heaven one final time. Let me read this verse to you in verse 12. It says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, 
For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. How long is that time? Three and a half years. What is this saying? Just prior to this vision of this beast, John says that there's a devil that was kicked out of heaven for the final time, sent down to earth. And that devil was going to indwell and possess this man, the Antichrist. It says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. The devil is going to take full reign and full control of the globe. Now we know he's a murderous, heartless individual. And he is going to pretty much be unleashed. If we live in a very ugly time now, our minds cannot imagine what those seven years are going to look like. And just in case we need any help, read Revelation. Amen? Amen? The seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns refer to his authority and allegiance of alliance of nations, mainly the revived Roman Empire. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24 tells us about the revived Roman Empire. By the way, in John's time, the revived Roman Empire engulfed a huge part of the east. So it wasn't just Europe, but it was also much of the Middle East or the much of the Muslim countries. So the Antichrist can come or rise up from Europe or he can rise up somewhere from the Middle East. Because in John's time, again, the Roman Empire was made up of a large, a large mass of land and countries. And so we don't know for sure, but we do know for sure that he's going to come out of the revived Roman Empire. And there are some Bible teachers who go as far as America being a branch of, of the revived Roman Empire of Europe. But we don't know for sure. So he could be Muslim. The Jews believe he'll be Jewish. We won't know for sure until that time. It's something of a one world satanic government and coalition. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3 says this. Listen to this. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery dragon having seven horns and seven crowns on his head. He's bring, bringing hell's power to the earth. And he's going to have nations on his side. He's going to have the globe wrapped around his finger. When it talks about crown, it talks about prime ministers and presidents and so on who are going to be on his side. This great dragon is coming to the earth. Full force, full fury. In verse 2 and B, the second half of that verse, it says, The dragon which is Satan gave him, the Antichrist, his power, throne, and great authority. Where does he get his power? From the devil. Now, doesn't this sound kind of like God the Father and God the Son? God the Father gives God the Son all power, all authority, and the throne. Satan is a copycat. He says, if God the Father can give Jesus those things, then I can give my Antichrist those things too. So that's what's going on. And it says here in verse 2, that the Antichrist kingdom will be like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. An animal-like kingdom, by the way. This is also mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. There's a connection between Revelation 13 and Daniel chapter 7. What he's saying here is this. The lion was the Babylonian empire led by Nebuchadnezzar. We all know who he is, right? He's the one that threw Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace for not worshiping his image. And the bear was Medo, the Medo-Persian empire led by King Darius. We know him because he was the one that had um, Daniel thrown into the lion's den. The leopard was Greece led by Alexander 
the small. I mean, great. The fourth kingdom in Daniel was Rome, which is John's time. But it also points to something bigger than Rome of his time, but the revived Roman Empire, the one world government ruled by Satan. John is saying that the Antichrist one world government will be as strong as all these past kingdoms put together. The Antichrist kingdom is going to be like the lion, Babylon. It's going to be like the bear, the Medo-Persians. Babylon, by the way, is today's Iraq. Medo-Persia today is Iran, led by King Darius. All right? And then the leopard was Greece. So he's saying basically that this last world power is going to be like all the others combined. And just so you know, when we read about Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, all we can say is, wow. And he's saying here, it's going to be stronger, more lustrous in every which way than Babylon and the rest of the kingdoms put together. This is going to be an unstoppable army in this world. If you think America's strong, America is going to look like a kindergarten uh, bully compared to this one world government. And the only one who is going to bring it down is Christ the rock. Amen? Amen. In verse 3, it says that he's mortally wounded, deadly wound healed, and the world marveled and followed the beast. And in verse 14, it says something very similar. The beast who was wounded by the sword lived. He was probably shot. And as you know, this sounds like an assassination attempt on the Antichrist that was made at this time. And maybe even a successful one for the moment. So this is again somewhat of a copycat of the Lord's death and resurrection. This is a counterfeit resurrection, if you will. And what happens is, he gets shot, he gets killed, and then he comes back to life and the people say, wow. There's no one like this guy who's got the power to die and live again. His name is Jesus, the one with that true power. Amen. But it also says that he's going to perform acts of lying wonders. So it's a possibility he did die. It's a possibility he didn't die. But it does say here that he was mortally wounded. But he uses this to deceive people. If this man can die and bring himself back to life, that's the man people want to worship. In verse 4, so they worship the dragon, the dragon which is Satan, and the beast which is the Antichrist. Saying who is like the beast and who is able to make war with the beast. Listen, that tells us that this again is going to be a mighty, mighty one world government. Satan is going to reign through his little antichrist, his ultimate satanic puppet. Well, the, que the answer to that question is, I already gave it to you, who can make war with the beast? God. There, there's the answer, people. People of the tribulation, those that are as asking that question, the answer is God. God is going to war with that beast and destroy him. He's going to obliterate Satan's earthly rule. So what does Satan want? Worship. What is Satan's number one desire? It's not money. Believe it or not, it's not even power. It's worship. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to take the place of God. Wants to take the place of Christ. That's what Antichrist actually means. He wants worship at any cost. Remember when he told Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you would what? Bow down and worship, worship me. You know what Satan was basically doing at that time? He was telling Jesus, be my Antichrist. Be my Antichrist. Because the Antichrist does this as Satan tells him to. Jesus said, mm, I'm the son of God. 
And the only one worthy to be worshipped is my Father. Amen? Amen? The war that heaven and hell wage is for the hearts. That is the worship of men. Only God deserves it, but Satan wants it. We find also there in Matthew chapter 4. Is it Matthew tw- chapter 4? Or is it John chapter 4? The woman at the well, help me. He says, my father seeks true worshipers. And if God the Father seeks true worshipers, guess what the devil is seeking? He wants what God has. And he'll do anything, even behead millions to get it. In verse 5, He will speak great things and blasphemies and was given authority to continue for 42 months. Again, he's going to have a really big, bad, stinking mouth. He's going to blaspheme God. He's going to say some of the cruelest things about God. Forgetting that God created him and gave him one of the best places in heaven as a cherub who covers right next to God. And he's going to speak evil about his creator in ways we can't imagine. Given authority to continue for 42 months means three and a half, uh, three and a half years. This is considered the second part of the tribulation, which is also known as the great tribulation is a short time. By the way, Daniel 9.27 says that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant. That is a peace treaty with many, with many nations. With many for a week. These are nations including Israel. And most likely it's going to happen in the UN. And he's going to make this covenant with, with Israel and the world. A seven year covenant. That's a seven year tribulation. One week points to seven years, not seven days. And he is most likely going to put in that covenant that they can build the third temple. And I believe that that will be the start of the seven year great tribulation. And if you want to know how far ahead they are in regards to the third temple, just go to the third temple institute. And you'll see there that they have everything ready to go. They're waiting for this man. To give them the green light. In verse 6, the Antichrist openly and clearly, vehemently speaks evil against God. He speaks against his name. He speaks against his tabernacle, which is God's holy throne in heaven. And he speaks against the angels and the saints in heaven. He is outraged as he was kicked out of heaven for the final time, never to be allowed there again, but to be judged and cast into the lake of fire in the end. He is outraged. He hates God. He hates heaven. He hates the people in heaven. He hates the angels who didn't come down with him the first time. And he speaks evil continually against them. This is one bad man. This is one bad man. Man, filled with the spirit of Satan. In verse 7, he will war against and kill tribulation saints and Jews. He will rule the entire world. Who are the tribulation saints? Who are these saints that he slaughters? Well, those who hold a pre-trib view, a pre-trib rapture view, believe that these saints who get, these are the saints who get saved in the in the tribulation, and those who have a mid-trib or post-trib rapture view believe that these saints are us. I hold to a pre-trib rapture, but I'll tell you one thing. If I'm staying through the seven-year great tribulation, I'm dying for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Give God praise. Verse 8, God reminds us here that he will not let them get away with this cruel persecution of the saints and believing Jews. The Antichrist will not get the last laugh. In verse 18, let us go back to that verse, uh, verse 10, I'm sorry. It says, he who leads 
Into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, he's saying, he's saying these people who are going to be beheading many people, including you, they're not getting away with it. Let that be your endurance. Let that strengthen your faith. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to bring down judgment on all of these people who touch my people. So he's saying, be strong, endure like a good soldier, even if it costs you your life. Amen? Amen? Why? Because the moment we're killed, we enter automatically, instantly into the very presence and the throne room of God. Yes. So death then is a victory for the believer. It's a nightmare for the unbeliever. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and read verses 11 to 18 there in the same chapter, Revelation 13. 11 to 18. This is regarding the false prophet. This is the Antichrist's right hand man. Uh, by the way, the Antichrist is most likely going to be a political figure. Some type of president, some type of prime minister, some, some type of uh, political figure. And, and the false prophet, he is going to be a religious figure, a religious leader. In fact, many men uh, even some very well-respected men like Dave Hunter, the Berean call believe that the false prophet is most likely going to be a pope. I don't doubt that. I don't know it, but I don't doubt it. So let us read here, 11 to 18. Then I saw another beast. Another beast? That is the false prophet. Coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises, notice that he has two horns like a lamb. So there's a part of him who's really humble, very charismatic, very loving. He looks like he will never hurt a fly. And then in reality, in his heart, he's a dragon. Fire breathing dragon. That's the false prophet, most likely the Pope. And let's keep going. Uh, <laughs> 12, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Wow. So he has the same authority that the Antichrist has. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one that causes the church to worship Jesus. The false prophet causes people to worship the Antichrist. And it goes on to say here, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. These are not some pyrotechnic skills. He's really causing real fire to come down. And the Jews are going to remember, are going to be reminded of Elijah, who called fire to come down. And so people are going to be amazed. People are going to be amazed. He's going to have this power, this authority to do these things. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image. Sounds like Nebuchadnezzar. To the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they refused to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar or his golden statue, and they were thrown in the lake, uh, in the fiery furnace. 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how high up the ladder you, you know, are. Artists, musicians. It doesn't matter who you are. Poor, rich, known, unknown. Everybody's going to be called to take this mark on the right hand or the forehead. By the way, we don't know exactly what this mark is. It could be a tattoo. It could be some type of electronic thing, the RFID chip. In Sweden right now, people are lining up by the thousands to get chipped. Right now as we speak, where? In the hand. So are we going to the beast just around the corner? Absolutely. 
Am I saying that that's the mark of the beast? Probably not, because the mark of, be mark of the beast happens in the middle of the great tribulation. That's how you know it's the mark of the beast. Anytime outside of that timing, it's not the mark of the beast. Is it connected? Yes. Is it it? Not yet. Remember, everything has to do with timing. What does the Bible say about these certain things? That's how we know what's going down. Amen? And it says, and then no one may buy or sell. Now, Americans love to buy and sell. So Americans that love this more than God will take the mark in a heartbeat. Except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. It's a number or a name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Again, by the way, we find what is commonly called the unholy trinity. I alluded it. I alluded to it a minute ago. For example, we have the Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we have here the unholy trinity fully activating, activated here in, in the last times, which is the dragon, which is Satan, right? And then the Antichrist, and then the false prophet. It's a copycat of the true trinity of God. And they will rule this earth for three and a half years. Seven years in a sense, but mainly in full power and full force for three and a half years. The second half of the great tribulation. In verse 17, it talks about those who, who take the mark. They're basically going to be a number. And so the question for us here today is, are, are we a, a name or a number? The name represents those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. If you've given your life to Jesus, your name is in that book. Or you will be a number, which means you will be a worshiper of Satan. In reality, everyone is either owned by God or by Satan. There is no middle ground. And by the way, the 666, again, it's the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. It's one number short of seven. Seven is a perfect number, the number of God. So it's a man. It's a very cruel man. And three sixes points to just how evil and depraved and fallen this animal like man is. Three, confirmation. He's a man. He's an evil, mad man. Six, six, six. That's what he is. And by the way, if anybody takes the mark of the beast during the great tribulation, they're in total allegiance to Satan. And there is, there is no hope after the mark of the beast. I know that some well-meaningful uh, preachers have preached that if you take the mark, you can still be forgiven and saved. But no, 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 that is not true. And I'm going to show you in Scripture in a moment. And so you cannot take the mark of the beast and still be saved. This stuff is not erasable. This stuff is not refundable. You take it, you die forever. You reject it, you live forever. And I want you to know that right now in our hearts, we're already making that decision. Amen. amen? amen. Jesus for us. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus for us. Hallelujah. Let's look at this mark of the beast with more detail. Um, Revelation 14, 9 to 12. Revelation 14, we're going to read verses 9 to 12. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his right hand, listen, this is the outcome. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints again. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those who reject the mark are those who obey God and have Christ as Lord. He says, that's your patience. That's your firepower. Amen. But he says here, there's no hope. You take it, you die. There's no hope. Now we still have hope. Some people have followed Satan. Some people love Satan's ways. But you have not taken the mark. You have an opportunity today to give your life to Jesus and make things right. And he will wash away all of your sin. Amen. Let us go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 to 12. These are the last passages we'll be looking at. <coughs> to know what's coming. And trust me, it's coming. Your subtitle may read The Great Apostasy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 to 12. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that's the end of time, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So there's going to be a great deception. There's going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away from, from truth to false religion and false ideas of who Jesus is. There's going to be many churches, maybe even packed churches, but they will be dead. They will have a name that they're alive, but they will be dead. And then he calls him the man of sin. That tells you a lot about the devil, right? This Antichrist, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness. It also says here the son of perdition. Perdition basically means hell. He's the son of hell. Jesus Christ was the son of heaven. I came down from heaven. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself. Who opposes God and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He has eyes for himself alone. Five, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know that what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit, and I believe even the church. We are the salt and light of the world. Seven, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Listen, only he who now restrains, again, the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, is the Holy Spirit going to leave during the time of the tribulation? No, without the Holy Spirit, man cannot be saved. But what he will do is pull away. Do you know why this world hasn't gotten into total chaos? Because the Holy Spirit has not let it. Some of us say, I can't believe God allowed this and allowed that. You have no idea how much God has restrained. Amen? Amen. In verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Some even say this points to the rapture. It's a possibility. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Oh, that's the end for this Lawless man, amen? amen. With the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The breath of his mouth also points to the sword, which is the word of God. God's going to speak and the enemy is going to melt. Right. All God has to do is look at the enemy's face with full glory and the brightness will kill him. 
Because nobody, not even the Antichrist, can see God and live. All God has to say is, look, and you will die. And that's what's going to happen to the Antichrist. God doesn't have to put gloves on. God doesn't have to buy a, a gun from the pawn shop to destroy this figure. No. All he has to do is look at him. That's it. Nine. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. According to the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth. That they might be saved. What does it take to be saved? You love the truth. All of it. What does it take to perish? You despise the truth, reject the truth, disobey the truth. You don't speak the truth. You don't live it out. You don't honor it. You don't love it. Those will be deceived and they will perish. 11, and for this reason, for this reason, God will send them strong illusion. In other words, because these people did not love the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus said he is the truth, which is God's word and God himself. He says, because they do not love the truth, God himself will send a strong delusion that they would believe the lie. What lie? That the Antichrist is God. They're going to believe him. So not only is Satan going to come against these people, but God himself is going to come against these people at that point. What does that tell you? Now we know that millions will be saved during the time of the tribulation. But millions will be destroyed too. Amen? They, it says, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What's the reason why people don't believe the truth? Because they have pleasure in their sinful ways. Bottom line, people do not want truth because they would much rather embrace any lie. Any lie. <laughs> anything that makes them feel better about themselves. Anything that soothes the conscience and supposedly heals their wicked heart and ways. They say, give me that instead of the truth. We want the truth. Amen? We want the truth. Just the truth. It says here that his name was um, the man of sin. He also has different names. As we know, the beast, the son of perdition, the son of hell, the lawless one, the prince to come, the Assyrian. Those names are found in Daniel, by the way. The wicked one, the little horn, and a few others. He's got all kinds of different names. Again, he tries to imitate Jesus, who is Emmanuel, the Messiah. The bread of life, the living waters, the door, the way, the truth, the life, the truth. Amen. And, and, and the enemy, of course, he wants all the, all the bad names. Jesus got all the good names. Just give me all the bad names, you know. <laughs> he can't have any of the good names because he's evil. Amen. Only the God who is good can have the good names. Jesus Christ alone. It says, is revealed, all false religions are waiting for some type of false Christ. And those who are not, quote-unquote, religious, because all are, those who are not, quote-unquote, religious, are, are waiting for some type of political savior. So somebody is waiting for a Christ, a savior, a redeemer, one who can fix this global problem. Everybody is looking for somebody, someone. For example, I got this quote from Brother James Fire. Some of you may know him. <laughs> he wrote an article about the coming Antichrist. And he makes this point. I'll just read it to you because I can't talk like him. <clears throat> <laughs> the world teacher by New Agers and esotericists, which also call him the anti or the Christ, which the false church will welcome. And so we have the new ages that are waiting for a Christ, a Messiah figure. They even call him Christ. They're waiting for the Antichrist without knowing. And Brother James goes on to say, the Jews wait for the Messiah. 
The Jews wait for the Messiah. I was listening to a Jewish man recently in a video, and he was asked if he believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He said, no. This is Judaism, by the way. He says, no. We're waiting for Ben David, the son of David. Ben means son in Hebrew. And then he says, you wouldn't change your beliefs. It's a Christian interviewing him, by the way. And he's on the holy mountain being interviewed. And he says, he says, we would rather go back to, to the Nazi camps. We would rather go to, back to Hitler than to believe in the Christian Jesus. So, so, so if this is the heart of Judaism, imagine the Antichrist is going to have a bloodbath with these people. Because they still deny their Messiah. The fifth Buddha by Buddhists. Buddhists are waiting for the fifth Buddha. The Hindus are waiting for Krishna. And the Muslims are waiting for the twelfth Imam or the Mahdi. We believe that all of these will be represented in this coming one, which scripture foretells and will be the primary unifying factor which shall create global solidarity in the political, religious, and economic spheres. It's going to come and, and fix things to get praise for a short amount of time. Everybody's waiting for somebody to save them. And there's only one Savior. And if they reject Him, they get no saving. Amen? Amen. This is almost my last point. <laughs> Verse 4 says, He sits as God in the temple of God. Here's a clue. There needs to be a third temple in order for there to be an Antichrist to sit in that third temple. Now what's interesting is this, last December 2018, the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish leaders, religious leaders, dedicated the official altar that will be used in the third temple. Did you guys hear me? They dedicated the altar, the official altar that they're going to use in the third temple, the Antichrist temple, for three and a half years. It's done. And when you see it, you're going to say, why is it so plain? And quite frankly, inexpensive and kind of ugly. Because in the Old Testament, God said, make sure it's plain. Don't make it attractive. And that's what they did. They could have made something with gold plating or silver or platinum plating, but no, they, they still, in one way or shape or form, want to do things as, as the Old Testament. But it's here. It's here. One woman was asked, yeah, we think that maybe next year we're going to put it to practice. She's hopeful. This points to just how close we really are, church. And listen to this connection. In Ezra chapter 3 and verse 3, when the Jews came back from their land, back to their land from exile, they built the altar first. And then the temple eventually came. Herod's temple. So it's the same picture. And King Cyrus of Persia gave them the green light to go back. And what's very interesting is the Jewish Sanhedrin sees our president as a King Cyrus type. Yep. They actually minted temple coins with our president's face on it. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. If they can connect the dots of the very last days, how much more not the church? <laughs> They're blind. We're not. Jesus is coming, church. Amen. Jesus is coming. I'm going to close here with Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. Mm 
How does this all end for the Antichrist, the dragon, and the false prophet? Let's find out. 20 and verse 10 says this, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where, listen, the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Where is this man, this man of sin going? He's going to hell forever. And his false prophet and their main leader, Satan, a.k.a. Lucifer. So what side are we on? Are we a name in the book? Or are we a brand of the Antichrist? Where is our heart? Who sits on the temple of our heart? Is it Christ or the Antichrist spirit? Who do we belong to? Let's be sure. Put your trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. Amen. All you have to do is receive him. He extends his grace and you grab his hand by faith and that's salvation. Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads. God, what an absolute joy it is to, to know, to know the future in detail as it's written in your word. You did this, Lord God, to give us confidence. In fact, the book of Revelation was written to give the persecuted church of the first century confidence and boldness in you because they were dying. But they were reminded that you are going to come again, you're going to reign, and you're going to rule, and you're going to defeat all of our enemies, all of them. Satan, sin, death, and hell will be destroyed and done away with for the believer. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us. Help us to dedicate our hearts to you, Lord. Help us to commit our lives to you. Help us to come to know you in a very real and genuine way. May our salvation in you be genuine and the proof be obedience and a love for you and a hate for sin. May we grow in this. Father, I pray that we would be awake. That's what I pray today, that we would be awake and that we would be alarmed by the signs of the times and ready for the coming of Christ. Thank you so much for your people. I thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives, O oh Lord. Every individual is being dealt with by you in one way or another, and I thank you for that. God, go continue to go before us. Be with us in every battle. Give us victory, O oh Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you and not on ourselves and the passing things of this world. Help us not to bow to anything or anyone but you, Lord, even now. You said wherever two or more are gathered, you are in the midst. Even right now, Jesus, you are here, and we acknowledge you. We know that you are the risen Lord, and you are with us in spirit, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you so much for that. If somebody here has not given their life to Jesus Christ, do so today. If you doubt, do so today. Amen. Be saved. Be safe. Be in the hands and heart of God. Amen. Because things are going down. But listen, Christ's people are going up, 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 up. Amen. Let us stand to our feet as we worship the Lord.